I am Dr. Shekhar Agarwal, Executive Director and Joint Replacement Surgeon at the Delhi Institute of Trauma and Orthopedics, Sun Parmanand Hospital in New Delhi. I shall be talking to you on periprosthetic fractures around the hip. The periprosthetic fractures are indeed a very challenging problem and this is largely because these patients are elderly and have multiple comorbid conditions. Apart from that, there is a presence of an implant which may or may not be loose and the underlying bone itself may be having severe osteoporosis or osteolysis making the treatment a very difficult and challenging problem to treat. The periprosthetic fractures can pr present in a myriad of ways and the incidence is seen to be increasing largely because of patient longevity, these patients are living longer than ever before, the number of primary replacements is increasing and therefore the number of revisions is also increasing. If you look at the incidence in various reported studies it ranges from 0.1 to 18 percent. The largest reported series is by Berry et al. 1999 in which they have quoted an incidence of 1 percent for primary hip replacement and a fourfold increase after a revision procedure. In this talk, I will take you through acetabular fractures and then the femoral fractures, give you the basis of classification and show you some examples of how these fractures can be treated effectively. Let's start with the acetabulum first. The fractures of the acetabulum are usually seen after an uncemented component. No fractures have been reported after usage of a cemented acetabular component. On the femoral side, the incidence is small after a primary hip replacement and it increases from 3 to 12 percent after a revision hip replacement. Let me take you through this Vancouver classification for acetabular fractures because these acetabular fractures are largely occur intraoperatively. In this, Type 1 is an undisplaced fracture which is stable. A type 2 is an undisplaced fracture but may compromise stability of the implant. And then there is the type 3 in which the fracture is displaced and the fixation of the cup is definitely compromised. If you go on to treatment, this is basically based on location of the fracture which is in relation to the prosthesis. Then we look at the prosthesis itself, whether it is stable or unstable. And thirdly, we look at the bone stock, whether it is adequate or in inadequate to decide the line of treatment. So when we look at the acetabular fractures, almost all fractures occur intraoperative during the insertion of an uncemented trial or an uncemented, uncemented implant. Prevention is far better than cure. So how do you prevent? You should avoid too much under reaming. You must take extreme care in soft bones such as seen in rheumatoid arthritis. There should be proper exposure and you must avoid thinning of the acetabular rim with too much reaming. So in the acetabular fractures, if there is a minor crack, which means it is a type 1, minor crack but a stable implant, then it does not require any further treatment. You can delay weight bearing and additional screws may be used in an uncemented cup. However, if you have a major crack and the implant itself is also unstable, then you need to stabilize the pelvis first. You need to use a reconstruction plate and then you use a cage or a cement plus a cemented cup and you may even use trabecular metal and in, in that case you may not need a reconstruction plate because trabecular metal itself will work as a bone graft. Here is an example of a lady with bilateral rheumatoid arthritis and protrusio and you can see in the post-operative film that the patient has a large acetabular fracture uh, which is unstable and the stability of the implant is compromised. So this was treated effectively by using bone graft, a reconstruction plate to stabilize the pelvis, use of cage, cement, and then a cemented cup. 
Let's move on the femoral side because these are the fractures which are far more common than the acetabular fractures. So if you have a femoral fracture which occurs intraoperatively and you think it's a minor crack and your implant is stable, you may use conservative treatment, just delay the weight bearing and in some cases you might require a circlage wire as shown in this example. However, if you have a major crack which occurs intraoperatively while seating an unsymmetric component and the implant itself becomes unstable, then you need to fix the fracture and use a long stemmed implant. What about conservative treatment for these periprosthetic fractures? We know that these patients are elderly and have multiple comorbidities. So if you look at systemic complications of conservative treatment, they could land up into pneumonia, DVT and decubitus ulcers. And then there could be local complications such as shortening, malunion and nonunion and joint stiffness. So this brings me to the illustration of the famous Vancouver classification which is used uh, globally for classification of these fractures. So this classification is basically based on location of the fracture and then whether the implant is stable or unstable and finally what is the bone stock that is available. So the first one is location of the fracture in which type A is a fracture which occurs in the trochanteric region. AG being the subtype, AG is in the greater trochanter region and AL is in the lesser trochanteric region. The type B is fractures that occur around the stem of the implant. B1 being the prosthesis itself is stable. B2 is prosthesis unstable and B3 when prosthesis is not only unstable but the bone stock is also inadequate. And a type C is a fracture which occurs well below the tip of the stem of the prosthesis. So let's look at the type A fractures which, which is the fractures occurring in the trochanteric region and then you could fix these fractures with a trochanteric plate or some screws or a tension band or use a tension band principle. Most of the talk is now going to dwell on to the treatment of type B fractures which is fractures that occur around the tip of the prosthesis. These are by far the commonest fractures that we deal with in our clinical practice. Again to reiterate and revise, B1 is a stable prosthesis uh, in which one can think of an internal fixation with bone grafting. B2 is a prosthesis is unstable and the bone stock is adequate in which you need to go on to revise the implant. And then we have the B3 where the implant is not only unstable but the bone stock is also inadequate. In these cases we not only have to revise but we have to, re we have to substitute the proximal femur. So let's look at these examples. So let's first look at type B1 which is fracture around the body of the prosthesis or the stem tip. The prosthesis is well fixed and the treatment is internal fixation with bone grafting and locking plates has been a big boon in the treatment of these fractures. Here is an example of a patient who underwent uh, cemented total hip arthroplasty and the circular wires indicate that the surgeon went through some difficulty of having an intraoperative periprosthetic fracture. This is how she presented to us and we treated this fracture with the use of menin plates and bone graft and here is showing a perfect union and an excellent result at six years follow-up. Yet another example of a patient who underwent this cemented total hip replacement uh, for rheumatoid arthritis and an eight year follow up and she presented with this type B1 fracture and we tried to treat this with open reduction anatomical fixation and rigid fixation using the locking compression plate. Obviously this, you, this uh, uh, treatment failed because this was not a biological fixation of the fracture the implant itself was very rigid and this is the lesson that we learned from this. Subsequently we had to go on to revise it and we have with a longer stem and an uncemented stem we did not change the cup and this is a three year follow up 
showing an excellent outcome from this procedure. In fact, a lot of these fractures can be treated with minimally invasive techniques using an incision in the proximal part over the trochantric region and then distally in the condylar region of the femur and then sliding a plate, locking compression plate percutaneously and then spanning the entire femur uh, to stabilize the fracture. So this is what it looks like diagrammatically that you span the fracture, you can put circlage wires or uh, even uh, cables and uh, then you can put these screws, the locking screws and stabilize the fracture. Here is one such example of a patient with an excellent outcome treated in a similar fashion using minimally invasive technique and a long uh, locking compression plate. Yet another fracture which was a type B1 occurring at the tip of this bipolar prosthesis and this was again fixed using a long uh, locking compression plate spanning from the greater trochanter to the distal part of the femur. Yet another fracture presented uh, in like this was treated with a locking compression plate, a five-year follow-up showing union of the fracture. This is yet another example of a B1 fracture which presented soon after surgery and the options in this case was to either retain the implant, do an internal fixation with metaphysial locking compression plate and bone graft or the second option was to revise with a longer stem and use distal interlocking and thirdly to remove the implant and do an internal fixation and use a shorter stem. So this is what was done. The implant was found to be stable. We did an internal fixation using the locking compression plate. The fibular strut graft was used and a lot of allograft was used which was encased in a wire mesh. And this is a two year follow up and however even this failed at three years showing fracture through the plate and the proximal part of the stem and then it becomes a real challenge of what do you do now. Let's move on to periprostative fractures which are the type B2 fractures. Again to reiterate this is a fracture which occurs around the stem. The prosthesis is obviously loose and there is sufficient bone for reconstruction. And in these type B2 fractures, one can go on to do a revision. Here's an example of a B2 fracture and a post-operative four-year follow-up showing an excellent outcome in this patient. Another patient with a bilateral B2 fractures uh, and uh, this patient underwent uh, uh, a complete revision both of the acetabular component and the femoral component because this was a long follow-up and a patient of ankylosing spondylitis, a three-year follow-up showing an excellent outcome by just doing a revision. Yet another patient uh, with a type B2 fracture, uh, the implant was removed and substituted with a long-stemmed uncemented component and had an excellent outcome. What about type B3 periprosthetic fractures? These are the fractures which occur around the stem of the implant. Uh, the process is, is obviously loose and the proximal femoral bone is not only uh, deficient but it is not reconstructable. And the treatment for these most difficult type B3 fractures is revision with substitution of the proximal femoral bone. An example showing that this is a patient with a type B3 fracture. Uh, this fracture was treated with a uh, large uh, uh, revision uh, ZMR type of stem and the proximal bone was reconstructed using an allograft and this is a six year follow up showing an excellent outcome in this patient using this technique. Yet another example of a periprostative fracture which is a type B3 in which a composite allograft was used in the proximal femur to reconstruct the bone defect that was present after this fracture. Then we move on to the type C periprostative fractures in which the fracture is well below the tip of the stem. These prosthesis is usually well fixed and sometimes these fractures can occur intraoperatively as well. So the treatment for these type C fractures is like any other fracture. You can treat them with uh, internal fixation or even you can use the MEPO techniques. Here's an example of a patient who underwent a total hip replacement uh, 
uh, uh, revision type of uh, hip replacement because this patient had a prior infection and after surgery something was found in the distal part of the femur and this was obviously a periprosthetic fracture that was discovered in the postoperative period and was treated with distal femoral metaphyseal plate and a two year follow up showing union of this kind of fracture. So in conclusion periprosthetic fractures is indeed very challenging to treat. The classification which is enunciated by the Vancouver group uh, is very simple and uh, very compact and easy to practice and uh, use it in clinical situations. The B1 fractures are by far the commonest. If you have a well fixed stem, you can go on to do an internal fixation with bone grafting. If the stem is loose, the bone is reconstructable, then you can go on to revise to a longer stem preferably an uncemented stem. However, if the stem is loose and the proximal femoral bone is deficient because of osteolysis or severe osteoporosis, then you need to revise it replacing the proximal femur either by an allograft or a megaprosthesis. One word of caution that the implant is loose or fixed can be deciphered or discovered only on the operating table because even the excess could be very deceptive and B1 fractures could indeed be B2 fractures. So you must have full inventory of not only internal fixation but also of a full scale revision should a B1 fracture turn out to be a B2 fracture on the operating table. Thank you very much for your kind attention.